Okay, we are in Hebrews chapter 2, and we're starting with verse 4. <coughs> in this section, it's the superiority of Christ. Uh, and here's Testament. Uh, so you're everything under the Old Testament, and first messengers of the Old Testament, starting in chapter 1, dealing with, uh, in chapters 1 and 2, dealing with the angels that he is superior to them because he is God in chapter 1, and now then in chapter 2 we move to he is superior to them because he is man. And the first four verses dealing with the superior, superior salvation to which we must give heed. Now then... We've already seen how that we are to give heed to that uh, more abundant heed to the things that we have heard. We talked about last week uh, this great salvation that was confirmed to us. And when it was first spoken by the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those original apostles and... God, verse 4, bearing, them, bearing witness, both with signs, wonders, divers, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we've talked about the three terms before, signs, wonders, and miracles. Signs pointing to something else. Um, then uh, the <clears throat> uh, wonders being that which it causes in others. Uh, when they see that miracle, it causes wonder or amazement in them. Uh, divers' miracles, in this case, it is dealing with the uh, power that is demonstrated by that miracle. Then we have uh, also gifts of the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, and to really get into a study of that, which we don't have time and won't do this morning, uh, you would have to go back and study 1 Corinthians 12th chapter and verses 4 through 11 about, and there it lists nine spiritual gifts. These were miraculous in nature, and so nine miraculous gifts. Uh, the... <clears throat> Apostles would have had all of those. They would have to lay hands on others to impart those spiritual gifts to other individuals. The only other case where you have it, the individual receiving it directly from God would be, of course, with Cornelius. Do you see, and I, I guess I should remember, do we see any, any place in the New Testament where it anyone who healed anyone other than the apostles and Christ? I mean, the, the, others, the, yes. other, the other gifts were mostly for the church. Uh, um. uh, I would say Acts the 8th chapter. Uh, you would find that um, with uh, Philip when he goes to Samaria. Uh, that they hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Uh, so... Uh, and it mentions, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. So that's uh, verses 6 and 7 of Acts 8. <clears throat> and, and then it, it would be like when he sent out the 70 also, I mean, uh, some of them were worth Disciples healed the, yeah, one of those things was heal the sick, yes, uh, the 70 in Matthew, the 10th chapter. So that would be another case of it. Um, but other than Cornelius and the apostles who received it directly, everyone else who received it, one of any of these signs or any of these gifts had to have the apostles lay hands on them. Uh, they were miraculous in nature. Uh, verse 5 then we then go into this section um, 
that Christ as man is made to have dominion. That's verses 5 through verse 8. And we see in verse 5 that it is not given to angels. Uh, that for unto the angels which he... Uh, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Uh, the world here is, do you remember our discussion in chapter 1 and verse 6? We use, talk about two different words in chapter 1 and verse 6. <laughs> what were they? In verse 6 it was talking about the inhabitants of the world. Right. Um, that's the same word that's used here. Um, it's not the Greek word cosmos, but it's uh, archimene, which is dealing with the inhabited world. Um, so, he did not put the inhabited world in subjection to the angels. This word subjection is um, actually it's hypotasso. Uh, now I'll come to another word later on. Hypotasso um, is made up of two parts. Uh, tasso is to place un, or to place or to arrange. Hupo is under. So, to place under, to put under. He did not put under, or he did not put the inhabited world under the angels. Um, who did he put it under? Right? Man. Man. Christ only as a man had that, um, or as a man had that. So it, uh, it applies to him because he is man. Acts eight talks about that. Uh, but the I mean, Psalms eight, I think. Mean. Psalms eight, um, which is what we're going to see in the next few verses, actually. But here it is. Generally, this word is used also in reference to put it in an orderly fashion to subject or to place under generally in a, an orderly fashion. Uh, so God did not put angels in charge of the inhabited world. What we're going to see, starting in verse 6, that it is given to man. That's verse 6 through 8. And verse 6, because they are the object of uh, his care, or of God's care. And this is a quote from the 8th Psalm, uh, specifically verse 4. Uh, <clears throat> and there were to, uh, the question, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Um, that's verse 5 as well. <clears throat> should also see, though, in reference to that, if you want to do some more study on it, uh, the 144th Psalm in verse 3, Job 7, verse 17 and 18. Uh, and there's always when we come to this section there's always a question where is Paul talking about man in general or is he talking about Christ this is a section dealing with Christ as greater than the angels so is he talking about Christ here or is he talking about man I think obviously, and we'll see this uh, even more so a little bit later, uh, he is referring to man in general, and Jesus because he is man. Uh, so, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that thou visitest him. Um, the word visit is from a 
word which means to look upon to help or to benefit, to look after or to care for. What is man that thou visits, that you look on to help or to benefit man, uh, to care for man? Uh, that's what he's saying here. What is man that you're going to help him, uh, mindful of him? Uh, in verse 7, man is made a little lower than the angels. That's the first part of verse 7, and the latter part of verse 7, and then the first part of verse 8, he's made from dominion. Um, and... that thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Um, the idea of a little lower, you could certainly see uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 11, whereas angels which are greater in power and might, is what Peter says. Well, that's the same thing that Paul is saying here, man is made lower than the angels. Um, but it's interesting, when you go back to Hebrews, the 8th chapter, and this is in verse 5 again, or not Hebrews, uh, Psalms, the 8th chapter in verse 5. <clears throat> thou madest him have, uh, thou, uh, thou madest him lower than the angels. Guess what the word angels there is? No, Y'all don't know Hebrews. No, that's Greek anyway. That's Greek. You heard me talk about it. Elohim. Elohim. Huh. Now what is that? I, I, that's the word in Genesis there. Uh, Same word in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1, yes. In the beginning, God. It's the word Elohim. God created the heaven and the earth. Well here, thou hast made him a little lower than the gods. And Elohim is a plural word. If you want the singular, it would be Elwa. So it is plural. So why did they translate angels for? <laughs> That's what far I'm going to Good question. Well, I mean, they to take a, a minute. A little lower than God, but maybe higher than the angels. <laughs> Does God next demand it? Well, let me answer. Um, there's a couple reasons. First, Septuagint translation, we've talked about that. Remember that? When they go to translate this word, they translate it with the Greek word angelos. That's angel in English. We basically transliterated the Greek word angelos to make angel. Um, and not with the Greek words, for example, God, which would be theos, or theos, or Lord, Curios, uh, they use the word angel. Why? Because the context, that is the idea that's being found here. Um, and angels, it's dealing with they are heavenly beings. They're not man, they're greater than man, they are heavenly beings, thus the term God. There has made him a little lower than the gods. But he is referring to angels. Uh, that's the context. Um, you could also see uh, the 82nd Psalm in verse 1 and verse 6, the 89th Psalm in verse 6, uh, Job 1 and verse 6, they are called sons of God there. Uh, the idea of son of is having the nature of. Uh, they have the nature of the God, not the nature of man. So that's why they use the word in, in the come over into the Hebrew letter. That's made him a little lower than the angels. Well, first, because he's using, as we've noted before, the Septuagint translation, which uses angels. It's the Hebrew that uses Elohim. Uh, 
So that's a couple of reasons why, but it's dealing with that ad that aspect of uh, the angels being uh, that a comparison between here's man and the angels. Man is lower than the angels. Um, but uh, thou set him over the works of thy hands. Thou put all things in subjection under his feet. Uh, what we see in that <coughs> is that or when, oh, maybe we should ask first, when did this take place? When were all things put under subjection to man? At creation. Okay, at creation. That's the context of the 8th Psalm. And if you look at Genesis 1, 26 through 28, you'll see that God placed man above the animals, above this world, that everything was created for man. So, all things are put under his feet. He's, they are in subjection to him. And crown him with glory and honor. Now, let's uh, make an application because we are dealing with Christ, aren't we, in this uh, as well. Right? We are. Um, well, all things were placed under the feet of Christ. Uh, but uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 28. <clears throat> For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he, he that for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Um, God has placed all things under his feet. He's going to rule for how long? To the last enemy is which is dead. Okay. Which is going to be at the second coming. Now then, he puts a qualification in relationship to that reign that he is accepted that put all things under him. In other words, God gave to his son, or the father gave to his son all authority does he have all authority over the Father? No. He's accepted. So, that, or that's the exception to the rule, I guess we would put it. Um, so, uh, thou made him a little more than the angels, crowned with glory and honor. Uh, did set him uh, over the works of it by hands. Um, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet and for, for in that he put all things in sub, or all in subjection under him he left nothing that is not put under him and that's what we dealt with in 1 Corinthians 15 but then he says but now we see not yet all things put under him now, are we talking about Christ or are we talking about man? <coughs> I don't hear you answer. <laughs> We're talking about man in, in this case. Now then, Christ, only because he was a man, that would this apply to? But now then, when we're talking about Christ, he was raised and sits at the right hand of God and as God. Um, we don't see him as man now. 
these limitations would not be along that line. But in regards to man, not all things are put under him. You know, that's because of sin within man. That man committed sin uh, and lost that dominion to a great extent. He lost that dominion that he had, that, that he was given in the garden. <clears throat> Verse 9. But, uh, verse 9 through verse 18, it's dealing with Christ as man brings glory to man. And then verse 9 here, but through the suffering of death, he does this. But the word but, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. The word but shows a contrast. He's been talking about man in general. Now then we're talking about Christ. Uh, that's how we know these preceding verses are not really dealing with Christ specifically. They're dealing with man. Now then, but we see Jesus shows we're going to a different aspect now, discussing Jesus. Um, <clears throat> and not man in general here. The Greek uh, says who was made a little, uh, the English says who was made a little lower than the angels. The Greek implies there for a little while. And that's certainly within the context of what we're discussing here, even if it's not implied in the very words that are stated, it's implied within the context. We see Jesus. For a little while, he was made lower than the angels. Well, who's lower than the angels? Man. And so Christ became man, and in becoming man, what? He became, for a little while, lower than the angels. Now, he's going to be elevated far above the angels through his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. And so it is for a little while he was made lower than the angels. Now, understand the Greek mind, or no, the Jewish mind during this time, because he's dealing with and really destroying any uh, idea that Mosaic law would be greater. <coughs> and they would say, well, look, he, became, he was a man. We're lower than the angels. Psalm 8 chapter shows that. We're lower than the angels. He was a man. Thus, he's lower than the angels. The angels gave the law to Moses. Therefore, the law is greater than what anything that Jesus could give us. Now, that's the way in which they would argue. But, but, but the, law, the law predicted its own cessation, though. In his own end. Well, that may be true, but they didn't recognize that so much. They, and certainly not with Christ or Jesus of Nazareth because they were rejecting him. But the whole argument, the law is greater than anything Jesus could give us because Jesus is man and man is lower than the angels. And since they gave the, the law to us, we need to keep the law. the other way too. But they would have been alright if Christ would have took the kingship and, and made a kingdom here and all they would have, they would have accepted it. As the kingdom, you know, That's true. Um, it's, it's, it's funny how when people get what they want they'll accept what they you know, but they don't get what they want, well then they'll come up with an excuse. And the Jews certainly would have in regards to Jesus um uh, setting up his earthly kingdom. Uh, John the 6th chapter shows that. Um, but what Paul is here showing, yes, he became man for a little while. There was a short period of time in which he became man and thus was lower than the angels. For what purpose? 
to die. Well, really not so much, uh, and I know what we're saying to die uh, in one regard, but it's not to die, but it's to bring redemption. Now, redemption was going to come through his death, so I, I understand that, but more specifically to bring salvation. And that, that reason that death is the only, only way he was they were eternal. And he was well, that's, they, that they could not die. Right, they could not die. God cannot die. So how is he going to die? He has to become man. And so it, in reality, it is showing his greatness in that he can become man for a little while and thus lower than the angels yet be greater than them. Um, and so that for the suffering of death there was the purpose. Um, because it says that without blood there's no remission of sin. So. Well, we'll get into that later on. Uh, without the blood there's no remission and so and with or without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Uh, he had to die. Um, it, and I'm going to kind of lay the groundwork if we should ever get to chapter 5. <laughs> Y'all quit laughing. <laughs> um, it, it kind of irks me at times, these individuals who talk about Christ and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying these three fervent prayers and his human nature supposedly takes over and he prays that if there's any other way to save man, to let it be hogwash. That's not so in any sense of the imagination. And so he prays supposedly, let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to die the death of the cross. He didn't want to go through that suffering. That's not the case. His entire purpose for coming to the earth was to die that death. And he knew it. Absolutely he knew it. Everything within his life was pointing to that death. And then to come at the last second and say, Oh, no, I don't want to die. No. So like man, not God. Yeah. No. Uh, he knew what was coming and looked forward to it. He, he, he still, but that's the step that you know, we'll get into in chapter 5. He, he still dreaded it as a, as, a, as a human being, knowing what it was going to be like. He looked forward to it. Yeah, I know. He welcomed it. And I know he welcomed it, but he, he, was, he was... What, what it, was he doing then? When he, we'll, get that, we'll get to that in chapter 5. Oh, okay. <laughs> if we get there. Yeah, I said if we get there. <laughs> You're going to be patient now, huh? Yep. Okay. Also, notice an interesting point here. We see who? But we see Jesus. Jesus. What does the word Jesus mean? Savior. Savior. He uses the specific word. Why didn't he use Son of Man? Why didn't he use Son of God? Why didn't he use Christ or Messiah? Why didn't he use those? Why did he use Jesus here? Because he is our Savior. He's going to die and save us. Yes, he is. But why did he use that term here? Same reason he used it in Matthew 121. Because he you're not telling the reason though. You're just saying the same reason whether well, that may or may not be. Depends on why you think you used it in Matthew 121. It was, it was man needs need, need to be rescued, needs to be saved. Why did he use the term here? There's a specific reason that you're dealing with. What's he talking about? Jesus becoming man for the express purpose of being our Savior. That's why. And so we see not Christ or Messiah, not the Son of God, not the Son of Man, not any of these other names that he could use for Jesus. We see 
the one who's the Savior. And that would have made an impression upon the Jews that he's writing to. The idea of his deity is being put in front of them. That's why I say, study the words. <laughs> words are so important. They mean something. I can't stress that enough. Um, so it is for the suffering of death. Uh, it was for a little while for this purpose of death. Crowned with glory and honor. Uh, and we could say some things about that as well, but we won't. <laughs> um, so, so a paraphrase, we would have put here, wouldn't say we see Jesus, but we see the Savior. That's what they put a paraphrase. Yes. That would be a, a good paraphrase because that's what the name Jesus means, Savior. Um, he by uh, crowned with glory and honor. I will mention uh, the word crowned is a Greek word, Stephano. Um, there's two words that are dealing with crown. This is the victor's crown. Um, a victor's crown. Uh, he crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God and we won't have time to go into a study of Titus the second chapter and dealing with the grace of God. Revelation 5, 6 through 14 shows the angels a thousand, sometimes thousands praising him for the suffering of death that he went through. Uh, you see that actually all through Revelation. And it's something that uh, we should do as well, uh, giving praise to him. But he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And we won't go into a study of Calvinism's limited atonement, that Christ only died for a few select individuals that God had determined to save before the world began. Christ died for every man. Uh, so we're skipping all of those things and all of those studies that we could have. <clears throat> Verse 10. He was made Savior through suffering. For it became him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. I therefore it became him whom for it became him him is referring to who no <laughs> the father has reference to God the father there it became him why is him not capitalizing I just think of the same thing they don't capitalize they don't uh, capitalized deity a lot of times in our translations uh, when it's a pronoun for God uh, it is oftentimes a matter of interpretation um, as to how they view the term and who it has reference to as well but here it is dealing with God the Father it became him God the Father for whom are all things, um, and by whom are all things. We know it has reference to God the Father here, bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. What are sons talking about there? The sons? Talking about Noah, Moses, and Joshua, and all the ones that, uh, Man. Salvation. <laughs> But it's talking here about man in general and bringing many sons, all of those who would be saved. Mankind. Mankind. Um, and it's interesting, in it became him means really it is suitable, it's fitting, it's seemly. 
for him to do this, to bring many sons into glory, to save mankind. Um, Is Catherine there talking about Jesus? Yes. Uh, which we were about to get to. But, but yes, Captain is talking about Jesus. Um, and literally it is a... You remember we discussed these words last week. Um, and one of them... No. This, uh, make sure I spell it right again. Um, the, so you're all taking notes, you're remembering, aren't you? <laughs> you're learning. <laughs> Archegos, Captain. What does it mean? Well, this. Kind of architect. Yes, um, first. first, the originator, founder, leader, uh, the first to cause something is what this means. He's the originator of our salvation, or the salvation. Uh, so... Um, Then the word perfect. There is a word. Uh, let's see. T L E. Can't see it. I don't know. Tell you. Oh. Tell you. Uh, tell you. Lost sometimes in noun form. Tell you. Oh. T E L E I O O. What does it mean? Complete. Complete. Um, I like the way in which one put it, to make perfect by reaching the intended goal. He was made perfect or complete by reaching the intended goal. What was the intended goal? Salvation. 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 Well, Obedience unto death, but it was our salvation that he's talking about. Would a good comparison of that be in First Corinthians nine, where Paul talked about the race, twenty-four to twenty-seven? I don't think so, really. Okay. Um, at least not offhand. I don't see how. Um, you, the goal was salvation. How was he going to be savior? How could he be saved? Well, what has to take place for there to be salvation and be remission? Shedding, Shedding of blood. How is he going to shed blood? By his, death. By his death. What is the suffering here? Well, that's sermon this morning, so uh, y'all. That's what you're going to on today? Yes. Um, he had to suffer, he had to die in order to be made complete in regards to being our Savior. So he is the originator of our salvation. He was made complete or he reached the intended goal of being our Savior through his death. Verse 11, through verse 15, he's able to, uh, to, able to demonstrate his power over Satan. Um, and for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He that sanctifieth, and the phrase he is not ashamed both of those refer to Christ uh, he that sanctifieth that's Christ is one who sanctifies us um, he's not ashamed to call them brethren that's obviously Christ 
they who are sanctified are all of one, though, um, is God the Father. Talking about God. So he that sanctifieth Christ, and they who are sanctified are all of God the Father. In which cause he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them brethren. Word sanctified. We don't have time to go into that study either, but uh, just write down John 17, 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and Ephesians 5, 26, and study those passages. Ephesians 5, 26. That's for mm -hmm. <laughs> See all this I'm skipping over just to try and get through a few verses. John 17, 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Ephesians 5, 26. He's not afraid to call them brethren. And for brethren, uh, look at 1 John 3 and verse 1. And we're not going to discuss that one either. But, keep this one, the word brethren in mind because it does we'll refer back to it later on. Verse 12 saying I will declare thy name unto I, my brethren in the midst of the church where I sing praises unto thee. Been misused to you to talk about uh, we're only to sing in worship to God and try to exclude the answer. It doesn't have reference to that. <laughs> It's not a discussion of our worship service or singing songs of praise to him. It is um, showing that uh, uh, in this verse, Christ and man both are from God. The word church here is the word ecclesia. It literally means an assembly. That's the word, meaning of the word. I know that in preaching about it, we talk about being called out because that's the, the meaning of the words as you break them up. Kaleo to call ek out of, thus to call it out. And it certainly has that application, but the word itself, ecclesia, means an assembly. If you don't understand that, you get confused for example, when it talks about the church of the Old Testament. Hmm. Well, it's just talking about the assembly of the Old Testament. Uh, that mob in the book of Acts, when uh, they uh, wanted to find Paul and pull him into the theater, and they stand in there, and I think it was in Ephesus, and yell for a couple hours, great as Diana, it's called this an ecclesia. It's not the church, obviously, that we know of, but it is an assembly. That's what this word means, assembly. Sing praise is literally from the Greek word hymnio, hymn. One to hymn. It's a quote from Psalm 22 and verse 22. That I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation where I praise thee. It's, that's why it's talking about the aspect of praising God. I'm going to I'm going to show praise and honor unto God. Both Christ and man both being from God and giving praise to him by the way in which we live and act. And I guess we'll have to start in verse 13 next week.